Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, welcome to another edition of uh, you download MFT. Basically, the textbook, uh, the, the textbook uh, MFT uh, series I'm I'm doing. Um, I'm on chapter eleven. I have, I think there's like thirty three chapters, so uh, it's gonna be long but very cool uh, read. And I hope that you do um, appreciate. I hope you do uh, share, subscribe comment be as civil as you can uh also um if you are if you happen to be uh in college uh taking uh the mainstream version of macroeconomics this would be a good opportunity to uh compare the two and see you have to see throughout history uh which one has actually been more accurate as far as uh telling you what when uh telling you what's going to happen uh because of the how the, how the current system is uh structured and uh lack of this lack of that like uh regulations stuff like that anyway uh but yes again please subscribe please comment please share please hit the bell please give it a like and also as always uh if you want other monetary theory um, material uh and shows uh you can go to realprogressives.org or you can go on to youtube as well and look up um the Rook Scholar with Steve Grumbine, uh, Status Who, also with uh, Steve Grumbine, the Luke Parker Show, um, and uh, Macro and Cheese on YouTube, as well as realprogressives.org, uh, uh, and a few other places actually that carry uh, information about uh, MMT. You can also look on uh, MoserEconomics.com. Uh, in the mandatory reading section, he has a list of for free downloads of all of his books that uh, Warren Mosler has written over the years. He's the, I guess you could say, the, the founder of the modern version of modern monetary theory. Anyway, uh, chapter 11, the classical system. Uh, chapter outline uh, uh, is going to be classical theory of employment, unemployment, and the classical labor market. Uh, what is the equi equilibrium output level in the classic uh, model, and so on and so forth. Anyway, uh, in this chapter, we developed the classical system of employment output determination. This approach was the conventional wisdom in British macroeconomics at the end of the 19, 1920s and was championed by the work of Arthur, uh, I think it's a Pigou, uh, P I G O U. In his 1933 book of theory of unemployment, the approach was attached or attacked by John Maynard Keynes in 1936, the general theory of employment, interest, and money. We refer to it as the classical system because that is how Keynes described his body of ideas. However, it is strictly a misnomer because of the class of the classical economic economists, including. Adam Smith, uh, David Ricardo, and Karl Marx did not use the marginal analysis uh, that defines the British Treasury view, which is more accurately referred to as the neoclassical in Part G, chapters 27 and 29. Yeah, this is a uh, what is this? This is a uh, Part C. So we have quite a few parts to go. <laughs> well, I do. Anyways, hopefully you listen and uh comment and all of this stuff anyway so we outlined the competing schools of thought about macroeconomic theory and policy which place classical theory within an historical context we review this debate from the 1930s in this chapter and next because many of the points of contention remain relevant today in the history of economic thought, Keynes intervention clearly demonstrates that the neoclassical approach we deeply uh, were, was deeply flawed. However, his insights uh, were ignored in the 1970s when monetarism emerged as the dominant school of thought. Uh, it's in chapter 18. Uh, we believe it is important to understand that the basis of Keynes' rejection of neoclassicalism to more fully uh, appreciate the flaws in current policy approaches and the reasons that modern monetary theory content, uh, contests much of the mainstream theory. 
There are four main, or yeah, four four main theore theoretical components to the classical systems. A one is a theory of pro product based on the law of diminishing returns, which links the labor market with the product market. Two, the classical labor market, which determines the real wage and total employment level under flexible. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, under flexible real. Uh, yeah, real wages, the operation of market forces achieves full employment whereby everyone who wants a job to find one and every employer who wants to hire can find an available worker. Uh, three, a theory of savings and investment which introduces the equilibrating role of the interest rate and ensures that there can be no aggregate spending short, uh, shortages and therefore no overproduction that might generate a crisis. Number four looks like the quantity theory of money which is used to explain the general price level. The size of the uh, exogenous uh, money t stock has no impact on the real economy but does impact nominal values. We first explore the operation of the classical market labor and the, oh, sorry, mar uh, labor market rather than the market labor, and the significance of diminished diminishing returns. This is followed by an explanation of why there may be unemployment and the determination of equilibrium output. Loanable funds theory, which is crucial to the claim that equilibrium output is associated with full employment is explored and the determination of the price level is then outlined. 11.2, the classical theory of, un of employment. We first consider the production function of the individual firm. This describes how much output the firm will produce for a giving, uh, produce for a giving a given labor input, given the stock of capital and other resources that it has at its disposal. In the short run, the stock uh, and the quality uh, of capital and other resources, such as land, are assumed to be fixed, and the only variable product, uh, productive input is labor. The classical system is underpinned by the assertion that the that production is governed by the law of d diminishing return, or LDR. Uh, this is also in Chapter 14. The LDR... Uh, states that when a firm adds more labor input to the fixed stock of capital, output initially rises but continues to do so at a declining rate. In other words, the incremental output becomes a smaller and smaller as additional units of labor are employed. The marginal physical production of product of labor, which is the extra output forthcoming from an additional unit uh, variable uh, 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 variable labor is positive but diminishing. Uh, and figure 11.1 shows the aggregate production product where real GDP or yeah uh, anyway, is on the vertical axis and total employment is on the horizon horizontal axis. The convex, uh, convex, convex shape of the production con uh, production function is based on the assertion that uh, that there are diminishing returns to labor. Each firm is uh, ass uh, assumed to be a profit maximizer and operates in a perfect, perfectly uh, competitive product market. Which can be summarized by the st uh, by the statement that each firm is too small to influence the price de determined in the market for output. Thus, each firm is assumed to be price taker to be a price taker, and it can sell as much output as it likes at that price. If we assume that the price level is P and the margin physical produ pro product of labor is MP, then the value of the margin marginal product, that is how much extra revenue the firm can expect to earn on it at, at each employment level can be written as 11.1 VMP equals P uh, times MP, where P is the price level, MP is the marginal product, and VMP is the value of the marginal product in non-monetary non, units.
The VMP curve is downward, sloping with respect to employment because of the assertion of diminishing uh, marginal productivity. The principle of profit maximization determines how much a firm will be prepared to produce and how much units of labor it was it will employ. According to the according to oh sorry accordingly the firm seeks to equate the return it receives from selling the last unit of output produced in, with the cost of production of producing that unit of output. This means the that the firm will employ labor up to the point where the additional cost employing uh, employing an extra unit of labor exa exactly equals the value of marginal produ product or VMP. The firm pays a mo money wage rate, uh, W, to the workers. The profit maximization rule thus means that um, 11.2 example, uh, W equals VMP equals P times MP, which can be re-expressed as 11.2 A W slash P equals MP. W slash P is the nominal wage uh, adjusted by the price level and represents the real wage paid to the workers. Thus, a firm will employ labor up to the pro up to the point where the real wage equals its marginal product to labor. That this well, excuse me, these concepts form the basis of the classical labor market and the classical theory of the wage of real wage rate and the level of employment. Accordingly, uh, total employment is determined by, oh, I'm sorry, that was, that was a continuation. Total employment is determined by the interaction between labor demand and supply and labor supply. Once total employment is determined, then the product, the production function tells us how much output will be supplied. The following equations define the classical employment and output determination model. And 11.3, labor market. N equals F uh, W slash P, or it's uh, greater than zero, or F is greater than, uh, is, sorry, uh, uh, less than zero. 11.4, labor market. Uh, sorry, labor supply. Uh, N equals G, uh, w, uh, G and W slash P. Uh, G is uh, greater than zero. 11.5, labor market equilibrium. Uh, N, uh, which is the lower, with the lowercase d, uh, equals N, which is which has a lowercase s, it looks like. Anyway, so 11.6, uh, production function, Y equals Q uh, and N uh, and K. Again, you have to buy the book to know what the heck I'm talking about as far as the letters and all this stuff. Anyway, so let's see, model, uh, where N represents the number of hours of labor input. Y is real output. W is the money uh, money wage. Uh, P is the price level. K is constant capital and other fixed production inputs. Our specification specification of the production function also assumes that the state of technology remains unchanged. Well, I'll change the line, actually. The terms F and G are these so-called first derivatives of the respective functions. So, okay, so C chapter 7, which I've already read. Um, okay, where was I at? Okay, so uh, seven methods, tools, and techniques. Uh, there's that, that's chapter 7. Uh, here they tell us about the slope of the respective functions that is, whether the relationship is an increasing or decreasing uh, functions uh, function of the real wage. The labor, market, the labor, the labor demand function 11.3 is downward sloping. The first derivative is negative in the labor supply function 11.4 is upward sloping. First derivative is positive. See, and there's this. Uh, okay, yeah, 11.2 uh, 11 has like, an X, uh, uh, an, an X, uh, sim uh, s symbolizing that. Uh, anyway, uh, why is the labor demand function downward sloping? Uh, equation eleven point two a shows that a profit maximizing firm will, uh, yeah, uh, will employ labor up to the point that the marginal uh, product equals the real wage. 
given the assertion of the law of diminishing returns, the marginal product declines as employment rises. Therefore, the firm will only be prepared to employ more workers if a if it can pay a lower real wage uh, rate, given that each additional worker is assumed to be less productive than the last. The firm will stop employing additional workers at the point where the real wage is equal to the marginal production product. The current state of the technology helps explain the, the position of the labor demand curve. If, for example, the firm invests in more efficient capital, then the products, the production function will or would shift upwards, and then each worker would become more productive. As a result, the labor demand function would shift outwards. Be right back. Hey, welcome back. Uh, we're at the section where it says, why is the labor supply function upward sloping? On page 167 of chapter 11. The classical supply function, or N, is based on the idea that the worker has a choice between work, which economists term a bad, be uh, term a bad because it undermines satisfaction or frees dis disutility, and leisure, which economists consider to be good because it adds to satisfaction uh, or utility. In this schema, or schema maybe, uh, work is only tolerated because it is the source of income which allows the workers to purchase other goods. The relative price uh, mediating the choice between work and leisure is the real wage, which measures the price of leisure related to income. That is, an extra hour of leisure costs the real wage that the worker could have earned by working for that hour. Thus, as the price of leisure rises, the willingness to enjoy is decline, uh, it declines. Just as the firm... Uh, is assumed to be a profit mar uh, maximizer to the worker is assumed to be a, uh, a utility maximizer such that satisfactory uh, utility uh, they drive do uh, they derive from an extra hour of leisure is exactly equal to satisfaction gained from the goods and services that the extra income earned from the extra hour of work would purchase. The worker is assumed to make complicated calculations continuously by collaborating, uh, yeah, collaborating how much uh, dissatisfaction they get from working and how much satisfaction or utility they get from not working and enjoy, or enjoying leisure. The real wages or real wage is the vehicle to render uh, these two complete or competing, excuse me, uses of time comparable are compatible by allocating hours to work such that the worker maximizes satisfaction. The classical analysis attempts to explain what happens to the number of hours of work offered by workers where the real wages or real wage changes. It composes the total change into two separate conception, conceptual, conceptual uh, components, a substitute effect and an income effect. The substitution effect refers to the impact on the web worker's decision to supply work hours of labor when the real wage, uh, real wage changes. If the real uh, wage rises, work becomes relatively cheaper compared to leisure, and the, min and the mainstream theory asserts via the so-called law of demand that people demand less of a good, of, of a good work when its re relative price rises. Thus, a higher wage leads to less leisure because time spent not working is relatively more costly in terms of wage given and more work. However, when the real wage uh, rises, the worker now has more income for a given number of hours of work 
The classical theory can invoke, uh, then invokes the notion of normal goods as opposed to inferior goods for which demand increases when income rises. This is the income effect. Classical theory assumes that like many other consumption goods which the worker might buy leisure is a normal good. Consequently, as the real wage rises, the presence of an income uh, of an income effect means that the worker will demand more of all uh, of all normal goods because they have higher incomes for a, no a good number of given number of working hours, including leisure, and thus the worker will uh, work less. Therefore, within this theoretical framework, the substitution effect causes the worker to supply more or less hours of work than the real wage rises or falls, whereas the income effect predicts that the worker will supply less and less or more hours or work when the real wage rises or falls. With these effects working in opposite directions, what determines the overall outcome? The conclusion is that despite the mathematical form of the classical theory of employment and the pretension of or pretension of analytical rigorous or rigor, the theory cannot tell us um, uh, unambiguously which of these two efforts dominates. The theory asserts that the uh, substitution effect dominates the income effect over the relevant range of real wage raise rates, excuse me, which means the labor supply function slopes upward with respect to the real wage. The basis for this claim is the reasoning that if the labor supply function sloped downward, it might not in, uh, intersect with the labor demand function. If the negative income effect dominates the positive substitution effect above a particular uh, real wage, then the labor supply schedule would be backward pending above this uh, above this real wage so that fewer hours of labor would be supplied this would mean that the, this labor market model would not yield a coherent theory of employment determination if we now if we now examine equilibrium in the labor market next section which is equilibrium in the next market or in, in the labor market Equation 11.3 to 11.5 represents a formal model of the labor market which yields mo both the real wage or W slash P and total employment or N through the equilibrium of labor demand and labor supply. See uh, labor, uh, see figure 11.2. Be right back. Hey, welcome back. Uh, as always, if you like what you hear, if you like the uh, book reading I'm, I'm giving you, uh, please feel free to subscribe, share, comment, like, hit the, uh, hit the like button and the bell. And if you also want more uh, more MMT material, go to realprogressives.org, uh, where you will find uh, macroeconomics, uh, or sorry, uh, macro. <laughs> Macro and Cheese, uh, hosted by Steve Grumbine. And you also, yeah, there's also uh, other places on YouTube like uh, the Luke Parker Show, uh, the um, uh, Zaz Coup with, uh, with Steve Grumbine, uh, with uh, Randy Grumble, and uh, with uh, uh, Jordan Sheridan. Uh, also, uh, he does um, Macro and Cheese on there as well, and, and quite a few other things as far as uh, with Real Progressives in Action. Uh, on YouTube. Anyway, uh, back to this. We turn to explain that theory, the theory next, noting that Keynes demonstrates that it that it was flawed at the most element uh, elemental level. The reason we want you to understand this debate is because the loanable funds theory is still asserted by mainstream economists, despite it is in a, inapplicable to modern monetary systems. 11.5, the loanable funds market, classical interest rate determination. The classical theory of interest rate determination provides provided a mechanism denying the possibility that there could be generalized deficiency in planned aggregate spending that would result in idle productive capacity and persistent unemployment. 
The classical view agreed that specific goods and services could be overproduced related to the relative to the pre uh, preferences of the consumers and firms, but at the same time claimed that rapid market adjustments would ensure that there could never be a generalized glut. The denial uh, that generalized overproduction could uh, occur has become known as Say's Law. After French economist uh, Jean-Baptiste Say, who po uh, popularized the view, the idea is sometimes summarized by either supply cre uh, supply creates its own demand. Uh, the logic is that the is that by supplying goods and services into market uh, into the market, producers are signaling a desire to exchange their output for another goods supplied into the market. Which sounds more like uh, barding, but anyway, uh, supply into the market. Uh, assuming for simplicity, uh, a closed economy without the government sector, which the typical, which is the typical depiction of the classical system, we know that is equilibrium. The total blow, the total flow of spending in the economy is equal to the uh, to the total real GDP and national income, or Y. Total spending is the sum of consumption, or C, and investment, which is I, expend expenditure. 11.7, Y equals C plus I. National income is uh, either consumed C or saved S, which allows us to write 11.8, Y equals C plus S. Thus, in equilibrium, total income equals total, uh, total spending, which is 11.9, C plus I equals C plus S, which means that the equilibrium condition is S equals 1, or uh, equals I, I'm saying 1 sometimes. That is, saving is equal to planned investment. Thus, all consumption goods and so, and are sold, and the remaining national income is equal to investment. The classical system considers that with withheld consumption is each period and is matched by investment spending. Given that saving is a signal that consumes uh, consumers want to consume in the future, first, uh, no, I'm sorry, bar, uh, firms are thus assumed to invest in future productive capacity to ensure that they can meet the demand that results from postponed consumption. Assume that the economy is is in equilibrium, and then there is a rise in desired saving. Consumption spending would, would fall in the current period, and to maintain the equilibrium output level, investment would have to rise. Ignoring the logistics of how real-world economic might quickly shift between the production of consumption and investment goods, reconfiguring machines and, and production pr pr processes. The theory of uh, loanable funds claimed that the continuous equilibration would be achieved by interest rate adjustments, which would always bring planned savings, uh, saving, and planned investment into uh, equality when households, household and firms' for, uh, for preference change. The loanable fund market is a really primitive depiction of a financial system. The interest rate, uh, which is R uh, or R, is a price is a price that ensures that planned investment is equal to planned saving in in any period, and is a market determined. Uh, savers uh, or lenders enter the market to seek a return on their savings to enhance their future consumption possibilities. Firms seek to invest enter the uh, seek to invest enter the uh, market to, to secure loans. The interest loan uh, interest rate that is determined in the market provides the return to households for their for their saving, and determines to determines the cost of borrowing funds for investment purposes. Uh, figure point eleven point five shows the market for loanable funds. The supply of loans is derived from current saving, which is assumed to be positive. Related to the interest rate, because a rising interest rate allows savers who forego consumption to be positively related to the uh, interest rate, because a, a raising interest rates allows okay, oops, uh, forego cons uh, consumption to enjoy higher levels of uh, consumption in the future by increasing savings now as interest rate rises. 
the return on saving rises, and so the so the supply of funds or savings rises, and current consumption falls. The demand for funds comes from the borrowers who wish to invest in houses, fun, uh, factories, and equipment, among uh, other uh, productive pr pr projects. Firms form expectations of further uh, future returns that they'll that they will derive from different projects, and rank the profitability of pro uh, projects given the cost uh, current cost of funds. As the cost of borrowing the interest rate uh, rises, the quantity of funds demanded falls because the net return on the planned projects diminishes and some become uh, unviable. Thus, the demand for loans investment is or investment is negatively related to the rate of interest. The interest rate adjusts to ensure that the supply of funds or saving equals the demand for loans or investment. In Figure 11.5, the equilibrium interest rate is R or percent, uh, which uh, responds uh, uh, corresponds to equilibrium saving or S investment uh, or I. If the interest rate was below the equilibrium rate, then the volume of funds demanded by potential borrowers would exceed the supply of loanable funds and a competition amongst borrowers would force up the interest rate. As the interest rate rises, planned savings would increase and planned investments would decline. At the equilibrium interest rate, the imbalance between supply and demand would be eliminated and planned savings would equal planned investments. The converse uh, follows if the interest rates is above its equilibrium level. Figure 11.6 shows the impact on the interest rate and the equilibrium level of saving and investment when households decide to consume more of their income in the current period. In this circumstance, the supply of the loans, or S, shifts to the left, uh, shifts to the left uh, say to S. At the previous equilibrium interest rate, or R, there is now an excessive demand for loans equal to the, uh, to the distance of A and B. Competition for the scarce funds drives the interest rate up, and a new equilibrium is established as R percent. And this corresponds with equilibrium savings, or S, or saving, or S, and investment, or I. The real GDP level is assumed not uh, is assumed not to change because it determines via the labor market equilibrium. The composition of the final expenditure and output changes in the classical system rather than the th uh, the total flow. The lower saving is offset by uh, higher consumption and investments and contracts accordingly. The, you might wonder how an, e an economy could make these shifts quickly given the production of consumption and goods and services will require a different mix of capital and labor than the production of capital goods. We will discuss that point, that point later. As a final observation, the classical si uh, system considers the interest rate to be a real vi uh, variable which adjusts to bring real aggregate demand into line with aggregate supply be in the loanable funds market. Thus, the entire real side of, of simple econo economy is explained in the classical system without reference to money. Real GDP, national income, employment, the, rage, uh, the real wage, and the interest rate are all determined in the classical system once we know the state of technology and preferences of households between work and leisure and consumption and saving. Another try it yourself. You should know, uh, you should now be able to outline the story of what might happen within this classical perspective should the borrowers, uh, borrowers expect stronger revenue flows from the investment projects. Hint the demand for loanable funds would be affected or consumers become more cautious and, des and decide to save more of their income. Hint the supply of loanable funds would, would be affected. Uh, as we will see in the following section, the only function that money serves in the classical system is to determine the aggregate price level and the inflation rate. In the econom economics le uh, literature, this separation in the explanation of the real side of economic of the economy and the uh, nominal side price level or price level determination is referred to as the classical. Uh, 
dichotomy. There we go. Okay, I was going to say something else, but never mind. Anyway, so 11.6 uh, is the next section, and that's classical price level determination. To complete the classical system, uh, to yeah, to complete the classical system, we consider its conception of aggregate demand, which allows the system to determine an aggregate price level. You will notice that we haven't introduced money into the model yet. The classical system considered money to be irrelevant for the determination of, a, of a employment, real output, the real wage, and the, inter the interest rate. But the output levels established once the real wage and, uh, and employment is determined in the labor market and the loanable funds doctrine ensuring that real aggregate demand will be sufficient to absorb the level of output. The question that remains is how to determine the nominal variables in the classical system. The two key minimal variables are the aggregate price level and the money wa wage rate. The determination of the money wage follows once we know the price level focus of um, uh, because me, the real wage is just the ratio of the nominal wage uh, to the price level. The classical system explains the determination of the price level by reference reference to the quantity theory of money. Money is solely or solely as a means of exchange to over to overcome the problem of double coincidence. Uh, coinc Coincidence of wants in the traditional barter models. For example, a plumber who, desi who desires the services of an electrician no longer must find electrician who simultaneously desires the services of the plumber. A given nominal stock of money, or M, which is a sum of dollars, moves between individuals as, ver at, uh, no, as various transactions are made over a period of time. The average number of times is sho the, the shock, sorry, the stock of money turns over each transaction made over a period of time. Okay, so it turns over each uh, period of course of uh, these transactions called the transaction velocity of circulation, or V. Uh, the product of the stock of money and the transactions velocity of circulation, M, uh, M and V, must therefore equal uh, the total nominal value of transaction in a given period. Strictly, the value of transaction is not equal to the value unless production uh, is, wait, I'm sorry, uh, trans equal to the value of a nominal output over the same period. Because as noted in the discussion of, of national accounts, or, or chapter four, I've already read that. Go back to that, um, which would be about, what, six episodes ago? Something like that. Anyway, um, unless production is uh, vertical, integrated there are transactions involved inter uh, intermediate goods and other services which are ex uh, excluded in the uh, calculation of nominal gdp note that financial transactions such as sales and, pr and purchases of financial assets are also ex uh, excluded from gdp but are ex included in the calculation of transactions at velocity Thus, to relate the money supply to GDP as we need to define an income velocity of circulation, say V, which is the average number of things the stock of money turns over in the generation or yeah, generation of national output. Thus, MV is equal to the total nominal value of output current GDP or current GDP, which is the production of real output or Y and the price of, of level or P. The quantity, uh, the quantity theory of money is thus captured by the following entity. 11.10, M, uh, M and V equals P and Y. The pr product V and uh, M and V is the money supply multiplied by the number of times each dollar is spent. So it will be, so it will total, uh, total to aggregate spending. The product M and V is a nominal amount and represents the total nominal aggregate demand to a given period, whereas the product R P, R P and Y represents the nominal value of aggregate supply in the same period. Obviously, these are equal, uh, equal since they simply look at total output and income from different sides of the transaction. The classical system assumed that V is constant, determined by spending habits and other practices. 
or including the time and frequency of wage and salary payments. Further, given that classical system assumes that the real side of the economy is determined without reference to the stock of money and the real wage flexibility, ensures that full employment output will be supplied in each period or as a result of continuous uh, labor market clearing. When uh, then I is also assumed to be fixed in each period of full capacity output. It is clear from, equ from equation 11.10 that if B and Y are fixed, then changes in M will cause changes in P. The classical system also assumed that the central bank controls the nominal stock of money it calculates calculation and thus is, the, is in a position to determine the nominal value of total spending. And it follows that with the real variables, Determined in the market uh, in the labor market together with the production function, the only variable that the central bank or government can influence is the price level. This, this no, this idea res uh, resonates throughout the history of economic thoughts, as we will see in the next chapter and in chapter eighteen. When we consider the Phillips curve, this idea led to the current policy resistance to the use of fiscal policy and the promotion of monetary policy as a primary st stabilizing policy tool. It is logically, it, it, it follows logically that if B and Y are fixed in, in any period, then if the central bank were to accelerate the growth in the money supply, or M, then all that this would accomplish is the ex uh, accelerating growth in the price level, which we call inflation. This theory thus provides backing for the claim that inflation is caused by, by the lax monetary policy. As a SEG, uh, SEG, SEG, -E I don't know, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it, into later chapters, uh, maybe it's a segue, into later chapters, the quantity theory of money is not a credible exp explanation of price level determined determination or inflation because in the real world b is unstable and economies clearly do not operate as at full capacity output on a continuous basis in chapter 10 money and banking were examined the theory of underpinning the money multiplier which the, the classical system relies upon for assumptions that the central bank can control the money supply we we showed that the that in the real world the consumptions are assum assumptions rather that underpin the operation of the money multiplier do not hold, and that the central bank is a, is unable to control the stock of money in the economy at any point in time. Further, as we saw in chapter ten, the money supply should be thought of uh, endogenous. Its quantity cannot be controlled by a central bank. Instead, the quantity of money tends to expand uh, procyclically as the demand for loans is met by profit sinking private banks. 11.7 Summary of the Classical System the, simpl the simplified classical system has the following features. One, labor demand is determined by the state of technology, which embodied in the production function and law and labor supply is determined by the per preference of workers for income and leisure. The real wage is the price of leisure. Two, the labor market continuously clears as a result of real wage flexibility. Three, market forces which cause equilibrium in the labor market simultaneously determine the va real valuable uh, variables me, in the classical economy, real wage, employment, real GDP, and interest rate in the interest rate. Uh, four, the nominal side of, e of the economy, the price level and money wage level are determined by the stock of money that the general that the general sorry the central bank is assumed to control the larger the larger is the money stock relative to the given real output the higher is the 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 higher is the price level number 5 looks like uh there can be no involuntary unemployment uh in this system because real wage flexibility ensures that a continuous state of full employment is maintained any persistent unemployment must be due to uh, rigid, rigidities, 
<laughs> we should use that. Uh, prevent the real wage from adjusting to the pre prevailing labor demand and labor supply conditions. Uh, six, government uh, policies should ensure that the real wage is flexible so that the labor market clears. Seven, the central bank causes inflation if it expands the money supply at a pace faster than the growth of real output, so it must coincide, uh, ex uh, sorry, exercise careful adjustment in its conduct mo mo monetary policy. And this is a summary of the classical system, which is 11.7. Uh, page 176. Uh, in 11.8, uh, pre-Keynesian pre criticism of the classical denial of involuntary unemployment. In 1936, publication of the General Theory of Employment Interest and, uh, Interest and Money by John Maynard Keynes is credited by many economists as providing the definitive, definitive analysis of the concept of effective demand. In Chapter 12, we will consider how Keynesian attacked the classical view that the real outcomes of the economy was determined by the full employment equilibrium achieved in the labor market via real wage flexibility. However, the essential elements underpinned the critique of Say's law in the modern understanding of involuntary unemployment in the monetary capitalist economy can be found in the work of Karl Marx particularly in his uh, theories of surplus value. Marx, in particular, provides a strong critique of classical e economist David Rick Ricardo, I was going to say David Richards, wrestler. Anyway, uh, David Ricardo, who is uh, who in his major work on the principles of political economy and taxation had championed the ideas of Say, which denied the possibility of generalized overproduction in the monetary economy and became known as Say's Law. The theory of surplus value, Marx launched an attack on Say's Law. He was uh, he was intent on showing that a money using a uh, uh, money using a capitalist economy was prone to to economic crisis, which we now know or we now know called recessions. And the unemployment was inherent intended, uh, inherent tendency of such a system. Marx challenged Say's law as well as the classical denial that the persi persistent unemployment could occur. Hold on. Uh, okay, so which is okay. Hold on. Okay, so a lot of place there. <laughs> uh, draw that money. A couple of coming. Which can uh, session? Okay, so let's see. Marx challenge okay, now persistent uh, unemployment could occur. He noted that Ricardo uh, assumed that consumers had unlimited needs for commodities, and having uh, a, an oversupply of one good or service would be quickly overcame by increased de demand for other commodities. Marx started from the proposition that a capitalist aimed to accumulate over uh, ever increasing wealth by extracting surplus value, which is production value in excess of what the workers receive in the form of wage payments. Generation of profits thus requires a a surplus value creation as the object of uh, production promotes efforts to reduce the payments to labor uh, or limit their consumption power and increase their productivity, and B, the sale of commodities and markets. On one hand, capitalists seek to, rep to repress the growth of wages and to increase work effort in order to maximize surplus value. But on the other hand, they... Only uh, they can only realize that surplus value as money profits if they can sell all the production. The rep the repression of wage inc income thus undermines their chances of achieving that. Marx readily identifies this in in uh, inherent contradiction in capitalism and argues that it was a pre precondition for crisis. Says law was best summarized by Ricardo, uh, 1821, uh, uh, 192, 3. Not really sure what the heck that means, but anyway, uh, when he argued that the decision to produce is motivated by the desire to consume. In other words, a producer either consumes their own production or uses 
the, uh, the proceeds from the produ production to facilitate the consumption of other goods and services. He thus considered that all production would find a buyer and there would and there could be no generalized overproduction uh, supply or supply greater than demand. Be right back. Hey, welcome back. Uh second portion of this whole thing. Uh however Marx observed that Say's law was refuted by the fact that crisis, uh, crisis arising from insufficient spending occur in the real world. Marx saw that sale and purchase are separate actions with separate motivations. He showed that Say's law can only hold in a barter economy which does not represent the essential features of monetary capitalism. In barter, you may consume your own good, a uh, good. Whereas under capitalism, no man produces uh, produces with a view to consume his own product. Uh, Marx, I guess, his book, Chapter Seven, Section Eight. A uh, capitalist must sell, and uh, and crisis will occur when sales either cannot be made or are only made at pri prices below cost. A capitalist may have produced in order to sell, uh, but if sales cannot be made, he how does this help? Would that say his law? Uh, it will help. It will. It was clear to Marx that capitalists capitalists aim to sell to transform commodities back into money and realize profits. Consumption is not the capitalist aim. Only the workers sell commodities or labor or labor power to consume. Marx focused on the special role that money plays and de demonstrated that this that it is more than a means of exchange. It, it is the medium by which the exchange of monies falls into two separate acts that are independent of each other and separate space and time. This is the key to understanding crisis, uh, crisis in capitalism. It was an insight, uh, was an insight that Keynes and other layers, uh, others later amplified. The break between production and realization of revenue from sales can occur between or because of this separation. For example, the existence uh, the existence of the chain of production and lines of credit means that a, a merchant may buy cloth on the credit or a or a typical arrangement, and the farmer sells to the spinner, spinner to weaver, and so on. If the merchant cannot sell, no one in the chain is paid. Marx's argument established for the first time that crisis manifests as monetary phenomena and that mass unemployment was not a voluntary outcome. Marx proposed that proposed what we call the MCM cycle. He said that modern capitalism requires the firms begin with money working or working capital to purchase productive inputs that they, they can conf they convert this money or m into commodities which is c which are goods and services that they hope to sell and realize a profit a, re a realized surplus value in the form of the money uh, more money than they started with m oh my bad hold on uh, which are the goods and services that they hope to sell and realize a profit Realize surplus value in the form of money, more money than they started with an M. In other words, they hope to end the cycle with M, which equals month, uh, which equals M plus realized surplus value. Capitalist developed the, uh, development is thus seen as continuous cycle in which M is converted into C with the aim of achieving M. <laughs> For Marx, the MCM cycle was the epitome of capitalist ambition to accumulate money as wealth. But it is possible that people might become pessimistic and hold their money be incomes in the form of saving. Money can thus be stored and spent in some uh, future period. So, if the expectations that led to or led the uh, capitalist as a class to commit resources to produce C and pay incomes are not matched by the sale reality, then it is possible that they will end 
up with less money than they began that cy the cycle with. In those situations, there will be uh, a general glut of goods and services. Marx considered that possibility of crisis to be a feature of capitalist production. Ricardo uh, had acknowledged that while some specific goods or services could be uh, in uh, oversupply, for example, as a consumer for preference changes or change, there could never be a generalized oversupply because human wants uh, uh, because human wants are unlimited. Marx dealt with the question of generalized oversupplying or supply by making a crucial distinction that remains re relevant in, in the modern debate. Overproducting or overproduction, excuse me, has nothing but and has nothing much to do with absolute needs. The debate is not about whether production can outstrip, outstrip needs. Uh, instead, my, Marx indicated that capitalist production is only concerned with demand that is backed by ability to pay. It is not a question of absolute overproduction. Uh, overproduction as so, uh, wait a minute. Of production as such in relations to absolute need or the desire to possess commodities, um, which is, I guess, in his book, uh, chapter 17, sector 9, or section 9. Uh, this was the first real statement of the principle of effective demand that began or became central to Keynes' work and which we considered in uh, chapter 13. Ricardo would say that if a person wanted some shoes, then they could acquire the means to buy them by producing something themselves. But he was referring to a barter economy. So why not just produce the shoes themselves? In capitalism, when there is overproduction, goods flood the market. Marx's idea uh, ideas were thus the precursor to Keynes' analysis, which sought to refute the classical notion that both the real wage and employment are determined in a labor market. In both Marx and Keynes, we see that the actual employment is determined by the level of effective demand, that is, in the production product market. While it is true that production of commodities for sale produces income to purchase them, those who receive money income do not have to spend it. Supply need not create demand for output that would be produced. Effective demand is the level of output at which business profit expectations are consistent with spending plans by consumers and firms. Thus, there is a limit of uh, there is a limit of profitable profitable expansion of uh, private output. The level of effective demand places a ration on the labor market, and there is no certainty that this limit will coincide with full employment where all workers who want to work can find jobs. In the next chapter, we turn to the critique of the classical system provided by Keynes. In conclusion, our preferred uh, pedagogy, I guess I'm still not sure how to pronounce that, is to outline valid theory before considering the alternatives that have been preferred uh, pro offered, excuse me, by orthodox economists, which we considered to be flawed. But it presenting, but in presenting the flawed approach before we study the Keynesian model in detail, we have departed from our usual preference. We do not, we do so in order to reflect the historical chrono chronology of the development of these key th ideas. In effect, the dominant view uh, in macroeconomics today reflects the approach that Keynes rejected, whereas MMT draws on many of the insights offered by Keynes, whom he, uh, we considered in Chapter 12. We reject the classical system as a valid way of understanding the way the modern monetary economy functions. Most modern orthodoxy macroeconomic approaches are substan substantially based on classical theory, that we analyze in this chapter and hence it to varying degrees are subject to the same flaws, many of which were exposed by Keynes. <sighs> There's a lot of references and, and end notes, but just want to let you know that uh, 
Uh, thank you uh, very much for listening. Uh, I hope that you learned something. I hope that my reading was, wasn't was as bad as it was during the mathematical portion of the chapter 7. Um, I also do hope that you do decide to um, to uh, subscribe, share, uh, hit the comments, uh, hit the like, and hit the bell. Um, also, once again, please uh, visit realprogressors.org for more macro uh, for more MMT related material, such as articles, uh, macro and cheese with Steve Grumbine, who uh, does a lot of great uh, interviews uh, with uh, Warren Mosler, uh, Mike Hudson, Steve Keen, Stephanie Kelton, others. He's also done at least one, maybe more than one uh, interview with a Marxist turned MMT or um, anyway, otherwise, uh, you can also see them on YouTube once again. Uh, you can see them at Status Quo with uh, Jordan Sheridan. Uh, you can also see Stephen, uh, Steve Grumbine on uh, uh, Let's Get Ready to Grumble. You can also hear him uh, do interviews as well, uh, on uh, Macro and Cheese and the Rogue Scholar. Rogue Scholar, he does. A uh, a basically just like an uh, MMT based opinion um, show. He's done some really good character work as far as that part goes. So check him out either way. Um, yeah, and also we're on Facebook, Real Progressives in Action on Facebook, uh, uh, MMT newbies, uh, and other places. Like just just look up MMT, and if you see even it says uh, uh, Real Progressives. That's us. So visit, uh, be an honest actor, as in like, um, if uh, if you do decide to question MMT or criticize or whatever else, uh, whatever you bring as far as um, uh, articles or whatever else, uh, look into them and compare it to MMT and see the functions or the foundations behind MMT and know that there are are too many articles out there and too many videos of people who who are currently getting paid by this current economic system, uh, which is fine by them, fine by them as far as the part goes. But they're also dishonest actors twisting a lot of the stuff that MMT says. So anyway, uh, again, thanks for listening. I uh, hope you decide to again uh, subscribe. I hope uh, you would decide to share, like, comment, hit the bell, and yeah, thanks for being here. Peace out for now. I'll be back tomorrow with uh, Chapter 12, I believe. Peace out for now.